Hello, my name is Bruce Jenks. I'm formerly from the Donders Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior at Radbow University, Nijmegen. Until my retirement in 2011, I was very much involved in the teaching uh, of neurobiology at this institute. One of my favorite topics was learning and memory. And uh, what I have done here is I've uh, produced a bit of a program here to introduce you uh, to molecular and cellular mechanisms in learning and memory. Now, I've broken the topic down into four uh, uh, subsections. I'm going to start here by introducing you to someone very special, uh, someone with the initials HM. And as you'll be seeing in a few minutes, HM has made a very major contribution to our understanding of the mechanisms of learning and memory. In the second uh, video, I'll be uh, looking at LTP, long-term potentiation, uh, which is uh, the basic mechanism, the molecular and cellular mechanism of learning and memory. In the third video, I'm going to uh, go on to look at some of the evidence uh, that a very special protein called the NMDA receptor is involved in this uh, uh, generation of LTP. And finally, I'm going to sort of tie everything together uh, by, in the fourth uh, video, showing you how you can make a memory with LTP. Now, in the course of these uh, lectures, you're going to come across a number of terms, long-term potentiation, for example, and of course the NMDA receptor. Uh, as well, you're going to be hearing about back-propagating action potentials, uh, coincidence detection, and you'll be hearing about synaptic plasticity. So these are just some of the terms you will be uh, uh, coming across in the course of these uh, uh, lectures or videos. So with this short introduction, I would now like to uh, uh, introduce you to HM. So HM, he was for the longest time uh, known only by his initials to the scientific and medical uh, literature. Uh, we now know that uh, he uh, HM stands for Henry Mollison. Now the reason that uh, we have his name now, uh, his name was released to, to the general public upon his death uh, in 2008. Uh, this is an, uh, an obituary from the New York Times at the time. I took it, uh, pulled it off the uh, internet. And I just want to read a little bit from this. I'm going to start right here. Uh, he knew about the 1929 stock market crash in World War II and life in the 1940s. But he could remember almost nothing after that. In 1953, he underwent an experimental brain operation in Hartford to correct a seizure disorder, only to emerge from it fundamentally and irreparably changed. Now, the seizure disorder that H.M. Uh, suffered was epilepsy. And by 1953, uh, at age 27, he was having multiple seizures uh, each week. And these were really life-threatening. And the doctors at the time, they felt that these uh, seizures might be coming from a very ancient part of the brain, deep in the brain, the hippocampus. So they uh, decided to remove the hippocampus. And this did indeed help with the seizure problem. And uh, as you can see, uh, Henry Mollison, he lived really to a ripe old age. However, uh, he did have these severe memory problems. Now, just to show you where in the brain this uh, operation uh, was done, uh, this is a, a, a section of the brain of HM. This is an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging uh, uh, image. This is the highest resolution brain imaging there is at the, at the present time. Here's HM's brain, and here's a normal brain. And just to show you where this section was taken, it's a cut right through there. And you see here in green, this is the hippocampus. So we've cut right through the hippocampus. And in fact, you have a left and a right hippocampi. The left and the right, they go to make up what's called the hippocampus. And you can see here in the normal brain, you have brain tissue in there and brain tissue in there. And in HM, all you see here are these dark holes. 
Now, to give you an indication of the severity of uh, HM's uh, uh, memory problems, I want you just to listen to this uh, little excerpt from a sort of an interview with HM. And this was uh, just a few years before his uh, death. I believe it was in uh, 2005 that uh, this clip was made, audio clip was made. So just listen to this. Do you know what you did yesterday? No, I don't. How about this morning? I don't even remember that. Could you tell me what you had for lunch today? I don't know, I'll tell you the truth. So, uh, very, very severe uh, memory problems. What I want to now do is just to describe to you a typical meeting one might have with uh, H.M. when he was alive. Uh, you would come in and you were perhaps uh, meeting him for the first time, so you were introduced to him and uh, could sit down and you could have a wonderful discussion with him uh, on many, many topics. And as long as you remained on topics before 1953, uh, things looked perfectly normal. H.M. Uh, liked music. Uh, he loved to discuss Bing Crosby, uh, one of his favorite singers. He was interested in politics and uh, uh, could discuss uh, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, particularly about uh, Eisenhower's uh, role as commander-in-chief in the uh, Second World War, the uh, uh, general in the Second World War. As well, uh, he loved cars and uh, was really quite fond of the 1951 DeSoto. Now, in the course of these discussions, uh, you're called out of the room for a few minutes, maybe five minutes. You come back in, and H.M. Uh, has absolutely no recollection of uh, ever having met you, and has no recollection of the conversation you just had. You can start all over again with the conversation. Now, it was from this uh, severe memory problem that uh, this indicated to scientists where to go in the brain. Uh, to look for the mechanisms of learning and memory. And this is really uh, uh, HM's contribution to our understanding, our current understanding of learning and memory. Before HM, scientists had made attempts to look into the brain for learning and memory, but they really didn't know well where to look. After HM, they knew, go to the hippocampus to look for the mechanisms. And it was then, uh, following HM, that scientists really started working on what's going on in the brain, what's changing in the brain when we make a new memory. And it's from work in the last 40, 50 years uh, subsequent to HM that we have now a reasonably good idea of what's going on. And what I want to do right now is to give you an overview or just to sketch out a little bit about what uh, is the current thoughts on how memories are made. Now, memories, of course, start with the sensory system. Eyes, nose, ears, bringing sensory information in. This information ultimately, directly or indirectly, comes to the cortex, and from the cortex it goes down to the hippocampus. Now, it's in the hippocampus here that we make the short-term memories. The memories are then sent back up to the cortex, and it's in the cortex where they're stored as long-term memories. And this process here is uh, called memory consolidation, when it's sent from the hippocampus for, for the short-term memory and made into a long-term memory. Now, properties, uh, hippocampus, this is very, very plastic. It can very, very easily encode uh, the uh, information it's receiving to store it in the form of a short-term memory, so rapidly encoded. However, it has a very limited storage capacity. The cortex, on the other hand, is very slow at encoding this uh, information, but it has an extremely high storage capacity. Now, in this memory system, the hippocampus has an important uh, filter function. It uh, looks at the uh, memories and decides if they're important enough, they will go up 
for long-term memory. If they're not important, then uh, they are simply erased, making more room down here in the hippocampus uh, for new short-term memories. Now, just as a bit of an aside here, uh, when you have a lot of new information uh, to learn, for example, you're studying for an exam, uh, you probably already know that you should repeatedly uh, uh, examine the material, read the material. So repeat, repeat, repeat. Uh, probably what's going on here, the hippocampus and this filter function, if it's continually being bombarded with the same information time after time, it finally gets the idea here well, this must be important. I'm seeing it so many times, so it sends it up for long-term memory. Recent research has shown that recall uh, is an even better strategy for stimulating this memory consolidation process. Uh, recall, just give yourselves little exams, little quizzes on the material that you're trying to learn, forcing yourself to recall it. For some reason, this really does drive the uh, memory consolidation. And one last point here, uh, most of this memory consolidation is occurring uh, during slow wave sleep. So the third little bit of advice here, if you're studying for uh, an exam, is to get lots of sleep. Now, getting back to uh, HM, HM's problem is he can make no short-term memories because uh, he lacks the hippocampus. But this is compounded by the uh, problem. He can't make any new long-term memories because memories are made first short-term and then into long-term. And without a hippocampus, no new memories can be made. And yet, all of these memories here, these are in the cortex of, uh, of HM. These were made prior to the uh, loss of the hippocampus. So HM is truly uh, someone who is locked into the past. All his memories are from the past, and he can produce no new ones. Now, one point I want to make here is that we are discussing right now a type of memory called declarative memory. Uh, declarative, uh, this is a memory for facts. I declare Bing Crosby is a great singer. I declare Dwight Eisenhower was president of the United States. So facts. It's also a memory for events. Uh, of the events, various events shown here, HM uh, has only uh, a real good uh, uh, memory here for the first one, Pearl Harbor, which of course occurred at the, uh, during the Second World War. Now, facts, events, declarative memory. The other major type of memory is called procedural memory. And here, this is for procedures or skills. Uh, things like playing golf, riding a bicycle, uh, playing tennis. Uh, these are uh, skills, motor skills, where the brain controls the very fine motor coordination of our muscles to produce uh, these uh, various uh, skills. These are called then procedural memories. And introducing this, uh, this uh, declarative uh, memory, these are hippocampal dependent. You absolutely require a hip hippocampus. The procedural memories, they have proved to be completely hippocampal independent. The storage site, or the ultimate storage site for the declarative memories, this is, of course, in the cortex for the long term memories. The storage site for the uh, procedural memories, uh, they're in a part of the cortex called the motor cortex, and another part of the brain called the cerebellum plays a very important role storing these procedural memories for the uh, coordinated workings of our muscles. Now, with these two memory systems, I want to introduce to you Brenda Milner. Uh, she is the uh, woman who actually uh, first showed that we have these two very different memories. Uh, and she actually showed it with work with uh, HM. Now, Brenda Milner, I should say, th this is a very, well, re reasonably recent picture of her because she's actually 94 years old. 
uh, at the moment and uh, she is still conducting research uh, into learning and memory. Now Brenda Milner, she uh, showed these two that there was two different memory systems working uh, by uh, using a method called motor uh, or uh, sorry mirror drawing. Now this is a procedural skill where you have to uh, take a pen and or a pencil and draw between these two stars. Now that seems pretty simple. Uh, to make it a bit more difficult you're actually doing this while viewing your hand and viewing the star uh, through a mirror. So that is really making it much more complex and in fact you're learning there a whole new way of operating your muscles. So this is very clearly a, motor, or a, a procedural skill right down here. Uh, now she worked with HM and uh, she had to encourage him a bit but she, uh, HM worked with her and in the course of three days he practiced time after time after time this uh, mirror drawing and uh, he finally became very very proficient at it. Now here's the uh, funny thing having learned it you could come in a few days later uh, bringing along a mirror and the pencils and uh, the, the uh, paper and ask uh, HM if he would uh, show you some uh, uh, mirror drawing and his reaction would be, well, no, 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 I can't do that. Uh, had no interest in, in trying. And you would push him a little bit. And he would say, okay, he was a fairly obliging person. And he would uh, give it a try. And beautifully, he would his pen or pencil would go nicely between the stars and not over the edges, uh, as you're seeing here. Which These are actually some of... Uh, HM's earlier efforts. And this even surprised himself. He had no idea that he could do that. Now, the problem here is that he's learned the procedural skill, but remembering you have the skill is declarative. I declare I can do mirror drawings. And the learning of it, that's in an event. And he has no recollection of ever learning it, of sitting down there and practice, practice, practice. So he has the memory in his procedural uh, memory system, but lacking a declarative memory, uh, he has no idea that he can, in fact, uh, has this uh, skill. Okay, so that's then introducing HM, and uh, as I've uh, uh, already said, HM's real contribution here was that he uh, indicated to scientists go to the hippocampus to look for mechanisms of learning and memory. In the next video we're going to look at one of the consequences of that research, namely the discovery of LTP long-term potentiation.